welcome to Oaken Bros. This is Eric. I'm Michael, and if you want to learn about the secrets of the universe, the law of attraction, law of attraction, mysticism, brohood, gambling, movies, pop culture, archangels, magic, good food, business, health, family, and mediumship, smash that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, press the bell notification for, uh, or press the bell icon for notifications, and spread this video around like peanut butter and jelly. That was great, Michael. So today we have on Dr. Justin Sledge. He is a professor of philosophy and religion. He has created a YouTube channel called Esoterica, which explores topics relating to the lesser known history of magic, mysticism, alchemy, hermetic philosophy, and more. Thank you for coming on, doctor. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's really a, a pleasure to be able to talk to you guys. I want to just say that there's some like our our like history must have separated at some point because you and my brother have an uncanny resemblance. I wish my brother had appeared. I don't know if it's the glasses, the the forehead. I I have no idea. But I was watching you. I found you on um on YouTube, and I go, "Is Eric playing a joke on me?" Now like, I know what I'll look like if I have a beard. Yeah, is Eric moonlighting as a doctor from you know? You're you're, you're in Detroit, right? I'm in Detroit. That's right. Yeah. So we could technically call you Doctor Detroit. I don't know if you saw that movie from from the '80s. I have, no, I've not. No, I've not seen that one. You know, it's, when we moved here, I uh, tried to binge a bunch of movies that were, you know, based in Detroit. Everything from The Crow to, to RoboCop and everything. But I missed that one. Look uh, at Doctor Detroit. It's with Dan Aykroyd. It's a classic from the early '80s. So. Oh, I have to check that. Out. Dan Aykroyd's great. So I want to just start out the show. First of all, thank you a million times over for coming on. We are Eric and I are so excited to talk with you. Um, real quick story, and we'll launch into your how like your story. Um, we lost our father three years ago. Smoked his whole life. Wasn't giving it up. Uh, had lung cancer. He beat the lung cancer. He died of COPD. Um, and you know we're very spiritual, and we said to our father, when you get to the other side, wherever it is, because we don't remember what it's like, we want you to reveal the secrets of the universe to us and we go to mediums all the time we just had a medium on george anderson who's like the gold standard for mediumship and um our dad came through in a reading specifically to me and he said magic is real the kabbalah is real that's what it's all about you have to start researching the kabbalah you have to research the archangels solomon it, it's real the magic of Solomon, don't be scared of demons because demons just mean spirit, I think in Greek, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to talk about that. So I started going down this rabbit hole and I found you. And you have been so instrumental in Eric and my journey in learning about magic with a K, not Penn and Teller, David Copperfield magic. I'm talking about- And we are, and, and we're, begin Dino. we're okay. beginner, we're beginners at this. So, well, just, so how, how did you get into this? You know, Eric and I went to Hebrew school, right? Our father, surprisingly, we found out was only half Jewish. But we went to Hebrew school. We were bar mitzvahed. The, the word Kabbalah was never mentioned to us before Madonna, before we found out Madonna was doing the Kabbalah. How did you get into this? It's ironic, or coincidentally, that you uh, you held up the copy of uh, the book by Dr. John by Dr. D. Man. Yeah, yep. by Dr. John D. I, I've written a bit on on, on D. Um, D actually, uh, curiously enough. Yeah. Really? So, uh, again, coincidentally enough, in fact, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the thing. There's actually a bust of D in the, in the background here. I have a, uh, I have a, a little bust of D I had commissioned and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm really interested in John D. Same. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it basically, uh, it was two tracks into sort of becoming interested in this material. Uh, the one was just growing up watching, uh, you know, Arthur C. Clarke's mysterious world and, uh, in search of, uh, hosted by Leonard Nimoy. And it would just be these bizarre episodes before I went to school on Atlantis and Bigfoot and magic and all this stuff. And it just the, it just really filled me with a sense of awe. And of course, Aristotle famously said that all philosophy begins in awe. And so the, the world just struck me as a, a weird place and worthy of investigating the things that don't typically get investigated. And so, uh, so that was a part of it. And then later in my life, I was, uh, I was learning Latin and uh, like everybody who struggles through Latin, uh, you realize that part of what makes Latin interesting is that it's so complicated. Um, and that uh, I was studying Latin and then I was looking at different languages online. And this is, I was a kid, I was, this is way back in BBS days, really early internet. And I learned about Dr. John Dee and allegedly he had these conversations with these angels, him and Edward Kelly. And I started looking at the Enochian language and the fact that I, I realized quickly that it was a language. It had grammar, it had syntax, 
Um, the words mutate in a grammatical way, right? So you have words like kaoskag, which uh, we don't know how to pronounce these words, but uh, mm -hmm. it means something like earth. And you see this word being declined, right? Uh, in the Enochian sessions and these Enochian calls. And to me, that struck me as profoundly weird because it's one thing to go to a Pentecostal church and simply enunce random sounds, right? Mm -hmm. It's another thing for a, a, a language to have a structure. And you, that's hard to fake. It's hard to fake a, a linguistic structure. You can't make up Latin or Russian on the fly. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so the D. Kelly stuff really intrigued me. Uh, even as a youngster, I probably was 12 or something at the time. <sighs> And uh, this just really stuck with me and uh, stuck with me so much that when I went eventually to Amsterdam to study esotericism at the, at the academic level, at the professional level, which is one of the wow. few places in the world where you can do that, uh, I wrote on D. I wrote, I tried to solve that question. Um, and that, uh, that article got published in a really prestigious journal in the study of Western esotericism called Aries. Um, and has been quoted extensively. People seem to ag agree with me to some degree, which is nice, I guess. Nice. Um, and so uh, that was my inroad. And, um, and so I come at Western esotericism from two points of view, one of which is from the academic side um, in terms of philosophy. I'm trained as a philosopher. So it gives me a critical thinking mind. So I'm, I'm critical of stuff, I hope. Um, and the other side of it, it's just a genuine sense of curiosity. Uh, why don't these things get studied? Yes. Right. Why, why, why is it that so you it, could tell your whole life and, and never hear, hear about right. you know, Paracelsus or D or... Or whatever, even if you don't agree with the fact that maybe that what they encounter was supernatural or whatever. That was that's my a, next book. That was yeah. my next book. <laughs> yeah, Paracelsus. That's yeah, a, that's a quite old copy of uh, that edition. And and it, there was this world, this underground world of things that I, I found to be fascinating that now populate my shelf and populate my mind and now populate my YouTube channel. Um, so, and I, I became just fascinated by these things. And part of the YouTube channel, part of the the program of that channel is to put out this information in a rigorous scholarly way without you know, woo or without my own personal opinion even often um, and put it out there in a way that's accessible, comprehensible and free basically to, to anyone who wants to, uh, to take up this. And of course, every episode I have has a reading list uh, where I point folks in the direction of further stuff they can read. Sometimes I had someone a comment that says it was a bit like a cult reading rainbow which I took as about the best compliment I could get. <laughs> um, that's great. Uh, so at some level, yeah, that's the basic, uh, that's a basic sort of inroad. And that's uh, at some level also uh, what I'm up to these days in terms of trying to, uh, to fix that problem, right? It's one thing to ask the question, why isn't this stuff better known? Um, the other side of that is to say, well, it's not going to make itself known. Um, and so right. I'm taking upon my, taking upon thank myself. You. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I had a question. Sure. You know, like we, you learn history in one way, right? And then as you start researching this side of history, it's so prevalent in really successful people's lives throughout history where you see bits and pieces of magic and mysticism. In, in history, were a lot of really successful and well-known people did they study the occult? Did they study alchemy? Did they have people that did it for them? You know, how prevalent was it back then? Because now it's, you know, you're, you could be as a wacko for, for thinking that way. So what, was it commonplace back then? Was it a secret back then as well? It was a mixed bag. Um, I mean, we, we can run the, we can run the, uh, the gamut of, of things, right? So, um, so for instance, astrology was practiced by basically everybody in the Middle Ages. That is to say that it was not esoteric. You could, it was taught in universities. Uh, alchemy was never taught in the universities. And so it, uh, it ranged from people who professionally did things like make paint in class, uh, people we would now rec recognize as sort of like practical chemists, all the way to very esoteric alchemists, you know, attempting to discover the philosopher's stone and you know elixirs to extend life, perhaps indefinitely. Uh, and of course, then you had ceremonial magicians, uh, and then people who did things like uh, what we would call Kabbalah. Um, and so um, now, once you get into the world of medieval ceremonial magic, that's when you begin to get into things that uh, you're not going to want people knowing that you're doing. Um, Things like the Inquisition are about, um, and you know, things like the Inquisition are about, and things like other other things that you you, know, you don't want to get burned at the stake, which did happen from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, Joan of Arc, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake because she believed in angels, right? Yeah. She was she was talking to angels. 
Yeah, her case is complicated. I mean, she was burned at the stake mostly because she was fighting the English and got caught. Right. Uh, that, you know, uh, but also, you know, uh, people forget also that one of the crimes she was accused of was cross-dressing. Um, she was wearing armor and that was a no-no apparently. But yeah, she claimed that she had uh, a unique access to revelations from God and that doesn't bode well um, if they want to build a heresy case against you, which they right. wanted They wanted to kill her. They just needed a, a pretext. Um, so, um, so would I say that successful people in the Middle Ages were were interested in the occult? I, I would say that um, that when you have an obsession after learning, you're not going to be able to limit that. No person can turn off their ability to quest after knowledge, and so it's unsurprising that people that really push the limits of what people knew in the Middle Ages would be interested in this domain of. Um, of uh of knowledge right uh, that's why john Dee, for instance began to talk to angels because he was like look i want to fundamentally understand how the universe works and let's just go to the architects of the damn thing um and of course that's that's uh, and he called them radical truths is the phrase that he used right and of course right. radical means literally uh radical means to go back to the root that's what that word means in latin and so we see people like isaac newton of course dabbled uh extensively in alchemy more than dabbled in fact he wrote uh, more than a million words on alchemy and, and esoteric Bible interpretation. Of course, you'll never hear that taking a physics class. Um, My God. So, so to, to a significant degree, I would say that people for whom the world presented itself as an enigma and the people that attempted to solve that from Roger Bacon to Thomas Aquinas uh, to a wide range of other people, yeah, they, they certainly uh, were interested in this material and, and, and researched it. Uh, the degree to which they practice it, right? It's a different question. It's a different story. Uh, it's hard often to figure that out, but certainly people like Roger Bacon are a great example of a person who um, was interested in what we would now call natural magic and things like that. When I, so give me one second, because we're talking like kind of like, I mean, there, there's famous people in this thing. So when I, when my father said, look into magic, look into the occult, because it's real, because archangels are real, and they are on tap for the slightest prayer. I started diving deep into musicians and celebrities who are into this stuff. Jimmy Page from Led yeah. Zeppelin, the greatest rock band of all time, bought Aleister Crowley's house, Crowley, however you want to pronounce it, yeah. on, on Loch Ness. Um, my favorite band in the world is Tool. Danny Carey, the drummer of Tool, I was reading an article on him and he was talking about Crowley. And then he said, he's really heavy into John D. I'm like, I'm 41 years old. When I found this out, I was 42 actually. I'm like, who's John D. And then I started going down the John D rabbit hole. Again, this stuff is not mainstream. And what you're doing, you're kind of doing God's work here that you're bringing the Kabbalah to light. You're bringing this stuff to light. Do you feel that it's, it's kind of catching on? The people are, are responding to it that like yeah. Jimmy Page was into magic. Yeah. We've been it, talking a lot about the age of Aquarius. Do you think that it's kind of all coming together right now? I don't know. I, I would say that there's certainly an uh, an interest in this material. Uh, you know, I opened I I started my YouTube channel just what eight months ago, and we're just now north oh, of about about eleven thousand subscribers. So it's mm -hmm. a pretty fast growth curve, all things told. Right. Um, I think people are interested in it. I think that people are interested, but people are also skeptical. I think that people are wanting information that's of a very of a high quality. That is to say, they they want to have information that's vetted by people who are, you know, they don't want someone just sort of getting on a video screen talking about whatever private revelation stuff they had. The toaster told them that Jesus is whatever, um, which maybe Jesus talks to toasters. I don't know. Um, but um, I'm not to judge. Um, um, but I, I think, yeah, I think that there's an interest. I, I think that people are interested in uh, this material. And I will say that we're in a golden age for studying this material. Yes. Uh, it's, it's the case that, um, you know, people will sometimes leave nasty, nasty comments on my, my channel. Uh, but like what? Like what? Uh, sometimes anti-Semitic stuff, but sometimes this sort of fundamentalist you know, you're teaching people witchcraft and you're going to go to hell and, you know, the devil is blah, blah, blah. Um, which it's I, strange because I don't, not teaching people witchcraft and teaching people about witchcraft. Um, um, which, whatever. Um, but um, we live in a golden age of this stuff. The fact that you, uh, the fact that you can go to things like Google Books and pull up medieval manuscripts of some of this material that, you know, even 10 years ago, you would have to travel halfway across the world to get access to some of these books. Uh, it's amazing. 
Right. I did an episode just a couple of weeks ago on an alchemical text from 1144, the, the first alchemical text actually to enter Europe. And this doesn't have, the text doesn't have a really easy to access English translation at all. Basically doesn't have an English translation that people can get their hands on. And so I looked it up on Google Books and there's the Latin edition of 1577. And um, I was able just to uh, read Latin. So I was able just to read it right there on Google Books. Oh that would not have been possible 10 years ago. Right. So right. We, we live in an age where um, there's no threat. You're not going to be burned at the stake, thank God. Uh, and the information is readily accessible. Now, of course, the problem is separating the, the information from the noise. Uh, and that's at least at some level what I want to do is say, look, this is the academic, scholastic, scholarly account of what this is, what, what's going on in these texts. And ultimately, at the end of the day, folks will take that and do what they, what they, what they will and what they want. Um, and so at least I can say, I can sleep well saying, I've given folks the best access to the information as it exists. And, um, you know, if you're a skeptic and you just want to learn about the lesser key of Solomon, great. If you're an occultist and you want to summon a demon, I can't say that I recommend that. Um, just, I mean, any more than I would recommend playing with plutonium or something. Um, but um, you just don't pay with powerful things. I don't know. I wouldn't handle dynamite. Just You, you, know. br you bring such a, like, you bring fun to esotericism. Like you, yeah. you bring, you, like what you said, like Tom, like uh, Agrippa, Cornelius Agrippa, right? I, yeah. I said that, right? You said he looked like Scott Weiland from the 90s. I'm like, <laughs> I got the Stone Temple Pilot reference. Like it was, <laughs> like, that was really good. Yeah, you know, I, I try to insert some humor. You know, I, I find that people should only take you as seriously as you don't take yourself seriously. Uh, and, and I find that, you know, things, again, I don't, I don't think education has to be dull and dreary and memorize a bunch of facts. I think it can be fun. And the fact that anyone appreciates my sense of humor is uh, just, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I uh, certainly do. Yeah, I'm, certainly glad. do. <laughs> I'm glad, you know, it's funny because I put like, I put sometimes hidden um, Latin things in there. I think there was a, uh, uh, one of the episodes I made, I mentioned, uh, I think Raphael or one of these, uh, Mid, you know, Renaissance painters, and I put the word Ninja Turtles translated into Latin beneath his name, and no one's gotten it yet. I, I put <laughs> Bellator to Studo, which means in Latin, like Ninja, like uh, Turtle Warrior. No one's gotten it yet. So I, sometimes I'll get messages, and people are like, Did you just translate Ninja Turtle into Latin? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, Ninja Turtles are my favorite. Actually, you can't see it in my thing here, but if I have a wire screen, I have a Ninja Turtles poster hanging in my office. I have a question uh, regarding do you know at what what is the earliest point of when magic has been revealed in history like how far back does this actually go documented documented goes this right i have a book in front of me i have a ton of books in front of me right this toth is that at the yeah. end of the tablets so i mean we have mad we have examples of magic reaching back to the very beginning of, of civilization written in um in sumerian right so this would be um, all the way back to the very foundations of, of civilization in, in, uh, in ancient Iraq. Um, so at least that far back, I would suspect it goes back further into prehistory. Um, so where did they get this information from? It's hard to say. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it's hard to say. I mean, there are lots of traditional accounts about where people develop ideas like magic from. Uh, it could be everything from a kind of uh, proto science where people are noticing correlations and causations and trying to manipulate those correlations and finding that um, that things that we would now call magic are part of that uh, part of that uh, that ability to manipulate the world in order to control it. Um, and of course, there there are traditional stories that you know, uh, for instance, in the Book of Enoch, there's a great story there where um, these uh, angelic beings come down from the heavens they mate with human women, which is difficult not to make an earth girls are easy joke there. Um, which, is, which, which is funny. Uh, another Jeff Goldblum, like a Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. joke. Which is funny because in the original, in one of the original stories, the, uh, the first human woman that these angels try to mate with actually tricks the angels, which is funny. Um, and uh, she doesn't end up sleeping with them. She ends up becoming a bunch of stars, which is a fascinating story on its own. But um Magic in that story, the Book of Enoch, is introduced by these uh, fallen ones, the so-called Nephilim, uh, as a way basically of corrupting human beings. And so uh, it, it's also from the very beginning as well, it has the sense of a dark side of it too. So uh, both of these elements, right, we see in the Code of Hammurabi, we see laws against uh, at least pernicious forms of magic, but also at the same time, 
uh, magic, uh, both in ancient Egypt and in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, was also just part of the standard repertoire of every doctor that existed at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, most illnesses were thought of as, as, as demonic or some level, um, and that they would be exercised as part of a, a healing routine. So magic has been with us since the very beginning of, of civilization, and I would almost certain to venture prior to civilization. Uh, it's difficult not to look at uh, the cave paintings and not to look at, um, which again, you have to imagine the, 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 the labor involved in painting those caves, right? You go in there in, the, in pitch black, uh, have to make fire to do all those paintings. It's hard not to imagine that that's not some level, some kind of shamanic business mm -hmm. going on there. And of course, um, you know, uh, the grave goods that we see various ancient peoples buried with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to believe that those grave goods aren't reflective of some desire on the part of the of the grieving to um, provide for the for the deceased in some type of afterlife or in some kind of magical protections. Um, both, I think, to keep people dead, we see evidence of the worry that the dead might come back in a malevolent way, but also so that the dead will have a, a good afterlife. And so we see evidence of grave goods. In fact, I think there's even cases of this in with Neanderthals. So it may not even be it may not even be specifically human. Uh, it may be broader than that even. Isn't that amazing? That that is that's mind bending. I mean, this is the ultimate conspiracy theory. I, I can call you Justin, right? I call you Doctor Sled. I mean, please, Justin. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, I I, I mostly put the the doctor in front of my name because I worked I worked my ass off to get it, and so I might as well. It's like uh, you know, you might as well stick it on there, and you I, know, call you, I call you Doc. I mean, that's fine, but no, no, I, I know Justin is absolutely. Uh, I appreciate absolutely. that. I appreciate that. Like, this is technically the biggest conspiracy theory of all time because people will look at us. People will look at the three of us, and I'm I'm lumping us all together. You're way smarter than Eric and I, but like, people will think we're nuts. I have I'm I just joined Facebook about four or five months ago, and I'm talking about magic and archangels and demons and all this. And people are like, "Are are what are you smoking, bro?" You know, like this is not mainstream at all. Do you think that there was some point in history that someone said, "Cut this off right now"? That someone said, yeah, "Stop." No, we definitely know that that happened at some level. I mean, of course, obviously, we have the the famous cases where. Um, the suppression of heresy in the ancient Christian world. We have uh, examples of the same thing in the Jewish world where uh, Kabbalah got out of hand and led to a whole false Messiah business in the 17th century. And that's why we have a lot of the prohibitions you tr typically and traditionally hear about Kabbalah, where you're not allowed to study it until you're 40 and you have kids and you have a job right. and things like this. A lot of those prohibitions were actually put on Kabbalah, studying Kabbalah because of a fiasco with a false Messiah called Shabbatai Tzvi in the, uh, in the 17th century. Um, and we also have cases, for instance, in the uh, Protestant world. There's a um, there's a history of philosophy written in the 18th in the 18th century by a guy named Johannes Brucher. Uh, it was translated into English, but it's not really well known anymore. And basically, what Brucher did in a really uh, a really fascinating way is that he basically divided philosophy into legitimate philosophy and into superstitious, crazy nonsense. And he mm -hmm. lumped uh, all of Hermeticism, all of the occult, Cornelius Agrippa, all that kind of stuff, Kabbalah, whatever. He lumped all of that into this, this is garbage and should be forgotten. And he basically, in the first edition, described it and said, this is basically nonsense and should be forgotten. And then in the next subsequent editions, it wasn't even included. And then when the history of philosophy began to be written, uh, many of the histories of philosophy were written in the shadow of this guy, Brucher. And when they were written, they were often based on that, the subsequent editions, and therefore that entire information is just left out. Wow. Um, and also, you know, we went through the Enlightenment, and, and of course, obviously, things like magic, mysticism, um, things like this are not going to line up with uh, Enlightenment views. Uh, and this is so much to the point where in France, I worked a little bit in some archives in France, where um, the first public libraries, the big libraries are being developed in, during the, the French Revolution. Um, this stuff didn't even get shelved. It just, just just did not end up on the shelves. And that is to say it ended up basically buried in archives. And so um, there was, I don't want to say that there was a conspiracy to suppress it, but I will say that there was a, a tendency among certain intellectuals at specific points of time where this kind of information did not line up. And eventually that kind of rejected knowledge, which is a term developed by the Dutch scholar Walter Honegraaff, one of my teachers, uh, and this rejected knowledge becomes sort of a, a dustbin of history. 
And a lot of this stuff ended up there. So this would include things, alchemy, uh, magic, uh, hermetic philosophy, even to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it has been, it has been somewhat suppressed. Um, and then of course, you know, what will end up happening is that the way knowledge gets reproduced through time is that you go through graduate school, you, you get a degree in philosophy and uh, then you go to teach philosophy. Well, if you never learn about this stuff, you're never going to be able to teach it. And uh, it is incredibly easy to go through graduate school in philosophy and never hear about any of these people. Right. 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 Uh, not because teachers are suppressing it, it's because they don't, they don't know. Uh, right. And so when I often, I would challenge professors on this stuff, I would say, well, Radical skepticism didn't begin with Descartes. It probably began with someone like Cornelius Agrippa. And they're like, that's not true. And who is that? <laughs> like, so what is, it? so explain to, because we, we're coming from a, 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 a Oak and Bros land of people that are not familiar with the K Kabbalah, Kabbalah. I don't even know how to pronounce it at this point. I'm learning about it. I'm reading about it. What is the Kabbalah? So the, the Kabbalah... Uh, yeah. yeah, so it all depends on how you, you know, there are lots of different ways of pronouncing uh, Hebrew, um, but I, I, I tend to switch back and forth between two different pronunciation schemes. But the, the Kabbalah is a form of Jewish mysticism. It's not the only form. There were forms prior to the Kabbalah. It's a, prior, it's a form of Jewish mysticism that began to develop primarily in two places. One in Italy, uh, that is the ecstatic or prophetic Kabbalah. Um, this was a form of Kabbalah developed by uh, a rabbi named uh, Abraham Abulafia. There's another form of Kabbalah that begins to develop around the same time, actually, a little earlier in uh, southern France and in Spain. And that form of Kabbalah uh, eventually led to the writing of a very, very important uh, book called the Zohar. Um, and the Zohar, the, which means the, the book of um, the transit, book of radiance. You um, named your son after that, right? Yeah, my child, one of my, my second child is named Zohar. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, Mazel tov, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, a book that's made a huge impression on me. And uh, such a beautiful book that I was, uh, I felt privileged to be able to name a, a kiddo after after this. Uh, incredible. Really incredible book. Um, and so the Zohar is, uh, the other Zohar is sometimes called the Theosophical Zohar, which is a $4 word for the combination of philosophy and theology. Um, and, and it's in the Theosophical Kabbalah that you get the Tree of Life, you get the Sephirot, which are these, uh, these sort of emanations of God. Um, I have it here too. I have the cheat sheet. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I need one of those. I can't, you know, keeping all the, keeping all the Tree of Life things uh, straight. On Amazon. It was like 12 bucks on Amazon and it has, it has everything. You yeah, know, yeah. Learning. Uh, yeah, it's, and so that's the Tree of Life, uh, the Eitz Chaim. And, um, and then the Kabbalah really develops in the aftermath of a, in, this is largely in the 16th century in Tzfat, in what is now Palestine, Israel, where uh, a rabbi named Itzhak Luria develops a completely uh, novel, in, uh, radical rereading of some of the texts from the Sefer Zohar. And it's there that you get a lot of the really classical ideas that, that people typically associate with Kabbalah. And so Kabbalah, in some sense, is the Zohar and then everything downstream of the Zohar. And then also there's another parallel form of Kabbalah that's not quite as popular uh, that was developed by uh, Abelafia called the Prophetic Kabbalah. And that's a form of Kabbalah where you, uh, it's a form of meditative Kabbalah where you meditate on various mystical names, specifically names of God. And this allows your consciousness to sort of clear away. And as your consciousness clears away, it's able to uh, reunite with the with the divine and then it, it basically you're able to sort of uh connect to to the divine and one is able to get kind of downloads in some sense from the from from the god god self mm -hmm. and so the the prophetic kabbalah was developed there um and these are two different strands they don't always get along but um in many ways these represent the two distinct forms of kabbalah as they've come down to us uh to this day uh, and of course there were forms of jewish mysticism prior to kabbalah um, and uh, mysticism has obviously uh, transformed since then. We have the rise of the Hasidic movement in the 18th century, uh, mm -hmm. hugely influential. If you ever, if you ever seen the guys out in uh, New York who are like, "Hey, are you Jewish?" We have, we have our our grandfather's side of the family. We have Hasidic cousins. We we used to go to their house for Rosh Hashanah like once every two three years or something. They never mentioned the Kabbalah to us ever yeah. about it ever about this stuff. It's just built into it's baked into that it's baked into that form of Judaism. I mean, in fact, I would say that in in many ways, Kabbalah is just the theology of Judaism now. There is when you 
there's basically no distinction between Judaism and Kabbalah. In fact, I tell people, if you've ever been to a Jewish service, chances are you've been to a Kabbalistically invented Jewish service, and that's Kabbalah Shabbat on Friday night. That service was invented, that entire service, if you've ever been to one, um, which I think most people have ever been to a Jewish service, have been to a Friday night service at temple or synagogue or shul, that entire service was invented by Kabbalists in the oh 16th century. And so Judaism is just basically deeply imbued with this form of mysticism in such a way that you, you it's one of these things where you don't have to say it. It's just baked in. It's there all the time. And right. so, um, yeah, many, many, many important hymns are, are, are directly Kabbalistic in nature. The, one of the main songs that you would sing uh, on Friday night, Le Chadodi, uh, that song was invented by a Kabbalist. Um, and it, was a, it has very strong Kabbalistic, not even overtones. It's just straightforwardly Kabbalistic. So it's just baked into Judaism uh, in a way that perhaps mysticism is not so straightforwardly baked into Islam or, or Christianity, perhaps. That's what I love about this is the more you learn about it, the more it's it's just hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's so interesting to me. Back in 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 time, ha, in in the text that you have been reading, has there been instances of proof, so to speak, of this stuff actually working? I guess it depends on what you mean by by working. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a skeptical person by default, uh, skeptical, but sympathetic. I, I, I think that those two things have to find a balance. Uh, I think you can't live your whole life completely being skeptical of everything that would be, it would be both awful and impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, and neither do you want to be, you know, gullible and just believe anything anyone tells you. Right. Um, I can't personally attest to it, my, any experiences of the supernatural I've had as an adult, at least. Um, and so I, I'm not the kind of person, no, that's not to say I've not had mystical experiences, but from a philosophical point of view, do I think that those, uh, do I know that those translate into knowledge about fundamental reality? I don't know that. Um, they're, prof <laughs> they're profound to me right? And I can speak from my own experience and, you know, and, and I can't venture beyond my own experience. And, and I, and I, you know, think that's just part of being, trying to be humble and trying to be trying to understand the limits of what human beings and individual people can do. On the other hand, um, when people ask me, does magic work? Does Kabbalah work? Um, if, if, you, if you mean that supernaturally, the answer is, I don't know. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, if you mean it in terms of, does it affect people's interiority? Does it affect consciousness? Is it a way for a person to heighten their consciousness in the same way that perhaps one would do something similar through meditation in the Zen world? Um, if, if you ask that question, that seems really clear to me to be yes. Um, ceremonial magic, other forms of meditation that are found in, um, in the magical traditions in the, in the Western world seem quite clear to me um, that they are uh, profound in their ability to affect people's consciousness. So much so, uh, I will say, uh, the program I, I studied in Amsterdam, uh, which again is a completely academic, scholarly, it is not Hogwarts, right? It's not that. Um, but um, she studied but, this stuff, by the way. J.K. Rowling was huge. Uh, there's, in, there's no way that she couldn't have had to write those books, right? Um, um, uh, but in in in, in graduate school, uh, there there were stories. Uh, I didn't know anyone who had this experience personally, but there were certainly stories of people who would go down the rabbit hole of reading a certain kind of text, would really get into it, and not just get into it, but get into the point where they're, you know. They're trying to reproduce it, um, and then they they lost it. They they broke down something that their consciousness couldn't do it. They were they jumped in the deep end, I guess. All right, whatever metaphor you want to use, and um, they dropped out of graduate school. Some people just kind of dropped out. They burned out, and I don't know if that's the combination of things like ritual magic and and drug use, or if it were or if it were pre-existing psychotic conditions. But we basically got a warning that said um, we're doing academic work here. You need to be also fully aware that there are texts in the history of this tradition that have the ability to, that seem to have the ability to profoundly co alter consciousness, and that those alterations are not always, um, you don't always get to control just how those alterations happen. And so, um, you know, caveat emptor, or caveat lector, rather, I should say, if I translate my Latin correctly, um, reader beware uh, with some of these texts. Really? So, um, so again, I, I think when, when people ask me, does it work? Um, well, from the supernatural angle, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I have yet to be convinced of that, but I'm certainly open to that possibility. 
absolutely. But absolutely from the interior side, um, do these do these techniques, whether Kabbalah or ceremonial magic or other things, do they have the ability to transform the interiority, the interior space of our consciousness? The answer to that seems to me to be a, 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 an overwhelming yes. What was your mystical experiences that you said you had? You know, I think I've had the experience, sometimes Freud calls it the oceanic experience, in, either in meditation or in prayer, um, where, you know, your consciousness dissipates. Your consciousness dissipates and you aren't you anymore. There's a kind of vast cosmic uh, nothing and something at the same time in which you are, you're just part of that vast continuum of being, of absolute oneness. And for brief periods of time, sometimes longer periods of time, I've certainly had the experience where whatever Justin Sledge is at, at this GPS coordinate at this time, uh, time, place, consciousness, uh, those things simply evaporate. And one is, um, again, I, you know, I can only quote the other mystics, I'm not as poetic as they are, that one is like a, uh, a drop of wine in the ocean, that you just become dilute into the vast sea of being. So yeah, I've certainly had those experiences, um, and I, I think that meditative techniques and uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, there's a reason why lots of cultures use various kinds of substances to induce or help one induce those 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 states. Mm -hmm. um, we have a strange anti-psychedelic bias in Western culture, which I find to be perplexing and unusual. It's very you, hard. Have you done DMT and ayahuasca? I've done both. Yeah, I've done I've done like DMT. I've done ayahuasca. Uh, what, what were those experiences like for you? I mean, they're incredibly overwhelming, obviously. Um, you know, uh, ayahuasca is very physically demanding uh, with the vomiting and um, and one the, it's the combination of the incredible physical demand of the of the drug and then um, and then the interior experience did it, did it with DMT. Um, yeah, I think that again, part of uh, part of what I've learned from my experience is both studying religion but also uh, studying psychedelic drugs, which I think are again, assuming a person is, mentally stable. I think it's very important that uh, right. anything, it's important that um, Paracelsus, right, said the, the poison is in the dose. And so it's not about uh, whether something's poisonous, it's about whether or not you're ready for it at some level. Right. And um, so, yeah, I think that part of those experiences has led me to a position of, you know, trying to be really humble, where, you know, when I approach things, I've had, you know, powerful experiences, and I try to say, these are my experiences. Are they do I want to translate that into becoming some kind of guru and tell other people what the fundamental nature of reality is? No, I don't want to do that. Um, right. What I don't was the that. experience though? What, like, take us, can you take us through ayahuasca and DMT separately? Did you meet Toth? I did not meet Toth. Um, you know, I, I, I did not meet Toth. I, I think it'd be neat to meet Toth. Um, you know, it, it, with the with ayahuasca, it's just a twelve hour slog where you know you're you're having these intense psychedelic visions and also you know vomiting your brains out, um, uh, which is part of the La Perga, right? It's part of the process. Right. Um, and the, the, you know, the vomiting the induces uh, 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 what might be called a higher state of the experience, I suppose. Um, again, it's so difficult to put parameters on these kinds of extreme experiences. Um, but I would say the same with the DMT is that, you know, you're, uh, you go from basically sitting in your study to uh, a world full of of uh, infinite fractals, light, color. Uh, it's as if, you know, Pythagoras talked about the universe as being basically composed of, uh, of number, of fundamental geometric structure. And it, it's, uh, it's akin, right, to peeking behind the veil, so to speak. Uh, I always give the, the example, right, what if you were Super Mario Brother, or Super Mario, and you were to wake up and realize, and you could see your own source code, um, right. you know, and it's something like that. Now, do I think that these, uh, these medicines or these these compounds do that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, human consciousness is such a is such a powerful yet limited thing, yep. and so I think that it's important to focus on how it's powerful, both for good and for ill, but also to to recognize its limits and be humble about what we can say about fundamental reality or something like that. So, do you think that we are just skin and bones, or is there more to us beyond our meat suits, so to speak? That I don't know. That I don't know. I, I don't know that we're 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 more than the material beings that we are. I do think that the material existence that we live in is actually much more complicated than people take for granted, right? Uh, you know, 
I tell people if you if you think that the world's not complicated, study the study the uh, the um, particle physics for a little while, and you'll come to the realization really fast. This is a big complicated thing that we do not fully understand by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Um, so far, be it for me to speculate about what fundamentally is when you know even me trying to understand the standard model of particle physics is something way over my head. And so uh, when I when I don't when I don't understand the math of quantum mechanics or something, it's it's not. I want to be. I want to sit back in my chair and say, you, I'm not sure you could really pass a uh, a high level physics class with a C. Much less try to speculate about the fundamental structure of of what we are. Can science explain everything though? I don't know. I mean, science. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I I, I think that any scientist worth their salt is probably going to say no. Not being a scientist, I don't want to speak for them. Um, but I can say that good scientists, the scientists that I trust, the scientists that I like, uh, are the ones that carefully talk about what we don't know uh, mm -hmm. and talk about the limits of what science can do and, and what it's done. And so um, I'm not being a scientist. I don't, I don't want to say what they can and can't do. But the scientists I trust are the ones that are humble enough to say, we are scratching the surface of a very vast thing and um, indeed scratching the surface of it. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you a real quick story, and I've said this on a few other podcasts, but I, I want to put this on the record for this one since you, you kind of go into the study of archangels, and we're talking about mysticism here. Um, a day before the reading I had with this medium where my dad came through and said, look into the archangels, I was meditating down by my pool, and I don't drink and I don't do drugs. And when I say I don't drink, maybe I'll have like five or six white Russians a year. Like that's the extent of my drinking. Okay. So I don't drink, never done drugs in my life. Um, I was meditating down my, by my pool, just being grateful and thankful and everything. And on my life, I have no reason to lie. Something landed beside me and I opened my eyes and I looked down and it was a foot. It was a big foot. It was huge. It wasn't big foot, but it was a big foot. And it, it had like this grace, this, um, this brown sandal. And I looked up and it was this tall creature. I swear to God, this tall creature with massive angel wings. And it was standing parallel with me. And it looked down at me. And he had this long, curly brown hair. And his, his chest hair was shaved very uh, tight to his body. Um, he had these big brown eyes. He was gorgeous. And this lasted one second. And I thought I was like, did my wife try and poison me at lunch? You know, like, did, did, did she like, did she put ayahuasca in, you know, the Caesar salad that I was eating? And I was like, all right, I'm just going to chalk that up to that was my mind playing tricks on me because that was real. There was someone right next to me. I saw it with my own two eyes and it was gone in a second. And the next day I had the reading with George Anderson, who's this mega medium, you know, the guy's the real deal. And he connected with my father. My father came through and said, Look, he's been scientifically tested. He's been scientifically tested. Eric, by the way, your mic keeps coming in and out. I don't know what that is, but um, here's a two. Is it? All right. Or whatever. Um, my dad came through and said, look into Raziel, the mm. archangel, Raziel. So I, I, the minute I was done with the reading, I started, you know, I called my mom and brother and I said, we got to start looking to archangels, this magic, this Kabbalah, the whole nine yards. And I Googled Raziel because that was the first angel. And on my life, this was the thing, the person that landed right next to me. That's exactly who it was. In exactly that same outfit with the wings and the hair and the face i could not believe it that was the real first i've seen ghosts before mm -hmm. that was the real first time that i witnessed something like beyond this this veil right beyond beyond the veil whatever it is have you ever seen an archangel or an angel in I, your can't, no, I can't say that i've ever seen a uh, you know aside from you know works of art or something like that but no i can't say that i've ever you know seen an angel and archangel um in fact in, at least in the biblical literature they're incredibly strange looking um really? you know yeah they have the you know the images from ezekiel where um you know that's a, the, the image you showed me is a pretty typical image of the renaissance the sort of classical renaissance right. uh, uh one form of angel uh, that's typically humanoid with with a, a pair of wings sometimes more than one pair right. typically sometimes six uh six different wings um, okay. But there are angels. There are angels in in the tradition called ophanim, which are actually wheels within wheels covered in eyes. Um, yes. And these are very strange and unusual looking um, 
uh, angels. In fact, in much of the literature that we that has survived, there's an entire form of mysticism called Merkava mysticism that existed um, way back in the day, way back in the temple days, in fact, of Judaism. And this form of mysticism involved um, descent of the chariot, your day ha Merkava, uh, which is weird because you you think of mysticism going up, right? We think of heaven being up, but these guys descended, they yes. down, which is very unusual. John Valo, John Valo's books. You know John Valo Melchizedek? He wrote The Flower of Life, the book. I don't know this book. John Valo, I have it right here. Yeah. Uh, he to this he talks about the Merkava. And I'm I'm in the middle of it. It's deep, it's heavy, but it's right here. Yeah. Um, the ancient secret of the flower of life. And then there's volume two. Do you know anything about uh the seven fruits? The seven fruits. No, I've not heard this. Yeah, we were um we were told to research that more. Um, they said yeah. So again, that was it came from our father. I had a reading recently with George Anderson. Before we go there, I want to ask Justin what his thoughts are on mediumship. Has he had experiences with that? Is is that part of what you study? So um, so spiritualism and mediumship is was largely largely developed in the 19th century, at least as we know it now. Um, of course, there have been mediums reaching back all the way to ancient times, uh, oracles and things like that. The Oracle of Delphi or the the, the so-called witch at Endor, the Baalat Ov at Endor in the book of Samuel, uh, where she summons the ghost of Samuel for King Saul. Um, I've, I've sat in on um, uh, situations or uh, cases where there have been people who can scry, which is where you look into a polished surface in order to see visions, the way John Dee and Edward Kelly did it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I've seen people recount incredible things, see incredible things, um, just say the most amazing kind of poetic, beautiful things, go into the trance states in which, you know, they seem impervious to things like extreme cold and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what to make of it. It, it. it seems to me that consciousness as we know it, uh, the normal stable state of consciousness, normal whatever that is, um, is just one tiny fraction of how consciousness operates. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and that, many traditions, uh, the Western esoteric tradition, but also many Eastern traditions as well, have developed a wide range of techniques for entering into uh, altered states of consciousness or alterations of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in those states of consciousness, people are able to generate information in a way that we we can't normally, uh, we simply can't normally. Uh, and again, I think that runs the gamut, everything from um, some of the poems of William Blake, I think were probably generated in states like that, all the way to the Enochian scrying sessions, which are patently strange. Um, and so it seems to me that consciousness is capable of lots of different states. And these, the, this literature, a lot of these techniques have survived from antiquity that give us a glimpse into those states. Now, the problem, of course, uh, one of the problems is that in the modern rationalistic uh, capitalist world where you're expected to make a bunch of money and uh, be good at school. And of course, school's very narrowly defined as passing standardized tests or whatever. Right. Um, those states of consciousness are not only looked down upon, but they're basically excluded from experimentation because you're just not useful to society if you're checked out in other worlds or something like that. Uh, at least you're not if you're working a nine to five job at, you know, Kroger or something. Um, and so I think that these states of consciousness have largely been dismissed. And part of what I find, and to go back to the, you guys earlier question about, do I think that this material is getting new life? I think that it is. And I think part of the reason why it is, is because I think that people are beginning to come to the idea that the standard way that we do consciousness is not exhaustive of consciousness at all. And there's really cool studies being done by even neuroscientists on meditation where um, you know, they've studied Buddhist monks and Catholic nuns. And it's very clear that these folks, even just from a scientific point of view, their brains are operating in a fundamentally different way um, neurologically when they're in these states. And so we're only now beginning to understand um, what these kinds of states are. Uh, for instance, the role of the temporal lobe in all this, right? The temporal lobe seems to play some very strange and important role in all this we don't yet understand. So we are just knocking at the door of uh, of a revolution, I think, maybe in, in consciousness at some level. Uh, that you know, again, I, you know, uh, Johns Hopkins is a great example where Johns Hopkins 
has launched the first study of spiritual leaders um, and psychedelic drugs. And so they're taking spiritual leaders who have never done psychedelic drugs, giving them those psychedelic drugs in a in a very controlled setting, and then studying it for the first time. And uh, these studies are yielding incredibly important results in terms of treating depression, to treating alcoholism, uh, treating anxiety conditions, uh, and permanent permanent alterations in consciousness that seem to get rid of it, so that you're not stuck on an antidepressant the rest of your life. Right. Um, so I, I just think that part of, uh, at least where my interest in a lot of this stuff lies, is that part of what I want to do is, is put this material out there and people begin carefully, I think, experimenting with this stuff. And um, we may recover, uh, we may recover things. People often think that people of the past were stupid or something. We think of medieval people as bumbling, dark ages, uh, and that's just the height of arrogance, like the idea that somehow we've landed on everything and we now have everything figured out and we know how to figure everything out. Um, that's hubristic and the extreme foolishness. Do you, have you ever, I just want to ask a question. Have you ever read the Urantia book? Yeah, I've have read the, yeah, the Urantia book. Yeah. It's one of uh, several books from that time period that were, uh, channeled. Um, yes. Um, yeah, I found out about Deftones. I don't know if you're a Deftones fan. I'm a huge Deftones tool fan. And they had a song called Urantia. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what's, what's Chino talking about? And I found that this, this is the tour of heaven. They basically, yeah. the tour of heaven. This is what it is. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, there's, one, there's another one called the Ohaspe, which is also was channeled around the same time. And there's an interesting woman who, um, I think in the late, late 19th century, she channeled um, Martians. I'm not sure. What, and there was another language. He revealed a, a Martian language, and this language is very, very curious. I'll eventually get around to doing an, uh, an episode on Esoterica of this of this Martian language. And again, it's one of these few strange languages that come from from channeled people, people who engage in channeling and reveal tongues that they don't know um, themselves. And of course, that idea goes back even to the New Testament, where uh, the apostles allegedly had the Holy Spirit fall upon them, and they could speak languages that they didn't know. And language is new in there, the language of angels, in fact, the text says. So these kinds of tomes, and of course, you, the Urantia book and the other books like this are, I mean, when I say tome, it's like a phone book as much as no, it's, the, it's the paper, I don't think anybody can see this, but the paper is like, it's like the Bible books. It's that you Bible, have, yeah. in it's like, in, in positively enormous. And again, also, I think that we shouldn't leave out the discussion, of course, of the Book of Mormon, which was also channeled, basically. Um, right, right. And so anyone who wants to dismiss this stuff as like marginal, and like the Church of Latter-day Saints is not marginal. It, it, it is a incredibly powerful, large um, uh, religious movement in which Joseph Smith admits that he used basically what we would now recognize as spiritualism and channeling to channel the Book of Mormon um, and other books, not just the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price and other things. Right. So this, this is a this is a, again, we think people think of this stuff as marginal, but it's anything other than marginal. It, it's just that we don't we don't spend enough time academically or otherwise paying attention to it. And we do that to our own detriment. Uh, the human right. experience is much grander than we imagine. And by only paying attention to a tiny, relatively small sliver of it, we're, we're, we're shutting ourselves, we're, we're, we're impoverishing ourselves by shutting ourselves out of the possibility of much more profounder ways of knowing things in the world. You're, you're a bit confusing to me. And Bear, bear with me here while I try and uh, ask this question. But you're you're incredibly scientific and incredibly practical. But then, are you, are you religious all at the same time? Yeah, I'm. I'm, we're, I'm, I'm religious. Yeah, my partner's a rabbi. You know, uh, yeah, she's yeah, she's the head of a spiritual community. I mean, I, I take Judaism, uh, my religion, my spiritual path quite seriously. Um, How do you marry all of that? Because like. Because so much, as far as I know, so much of Judaism relies on faith, and and kind of not knowing. But then you also seem like the type of guy that needs proof. So how do you? How do you? Unless unless I'm wrong, but no, I know uh, it's uh, you're, the question is how do I marry? And then the answer is I, I don't. Uh, I'm I'm a bachelor. I, I'm I'm sleeping around, man. Uh, I, I flirt with <laughs> have flirt with science and flirt with religion. Um, uh, the an the answer is that this is that, that we're that I don't have all the answers. That's the first answer. Um, right. Martin Buber famously said, the Hasidic uh, modern Hasidic um, writer said that we're thrown into a world of contradiction, and if we sail so high above those contradictions that they all begin to make sense, then we've evaded our task. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I take that really seriously, that we're thrown into a world of contradiction and that some of these contradictions that we're just not going to resolve just because human beings are not that smart and just, we're just not. Like, I'm not a stupid person, I don't think, but I'm not so arrogant and stiff necked to think that I'm going to understand all this stuff. So I think that it's about appropriateness. Um, when someone makes a really extravagant claim, right? Like, you know, Michael, you said that you saw an archangel. Uh, do I know that you did? No, I don't know. Right. Do, I, do, do I do I want to go looking to just prove you? No, that's not a healthy impulse. That's right. just, that's a that's a weird impulse. It's this it's this right. heresy hunting impulse, and I don't trust that. Yeah. It's like religious McCarthyism. Like, who wants to yes. be that kind of person? Yes. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to say, for me. Uh, I want to take people's experiences seriously. And at the same time, I want to say, let's try to be as clear headed as we can be about them. And that's true of my experiences as well. And so when I think about how I relate my own skepticism or my own critical thinking to my own religious and spiritual beliefs, the answer is, is that I keep them in a dialogue. And that means that n neither one gets to talk over the other one. And it means that uh, neither one I, I don't let the hubris of either one have the last word because neither one of them is going to be able to do that. That's brilliant. That's so absolutely brilliant. You're, you're a philosopher first. I, I, again, it, de it depends, right? It depends when I'm, it's hard to say that I'm a philosopher when I have uh, to fill in on, you know, and, and, and praying at Yom Kippur and I feel, you know, dissolved into the sea of the one. Um, am I a philosopher at that moment? I don't think so. Um, now, also, right, when someone comes in, you know, tells me that if you wear it to fill in every day, then you'll never get cancer. then I'm like, eh, I, I don't know that's true either. Right. I, it, I, I get skeptical of these sorts of things. Or uh, So um, the answer is um, I, I try to hold both in each hand and I, I try to walk with both in each hand. And um, when one feels like it's getting the upper hand, then I, I make sure it knows its place. So. No, I don't know how to strike that balance. I don't think anyone does, but I do think that it's imperative for me as a scholar to, to find a way to strike that balance. And also when I'm teaching or when I'm doing educational work for me to say, look, I'm going to bracket off my own experiences. I'm going to put the information as we have it as clearly as we can um, and say that I'm not here to, to tell anyone the truth. I'm here to say this is the combined efforts of scholars to present the information as we have it. And then after that, all I can say is someone says, was it true? I'm like, well, I think we're going to have to, well, the, the question, the answer is we're going to have a lot, we have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. so, right. um, what, when are you going to write your book? When are you going to write like your tome? Because you, you are, you're a brilliant man. The wealth of information you have. Yes. YouTube is central to what you're doing, but I think you need to write your 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 five i mean obviously like it doesn't have to be channeled right but you need to write your five books of mystery you know, you really yeah you know the youtube thing is it's sort, of, sort of a popularization of a lot of this stuff and there is a book cooking in my head that i, I don't know when it will when it will it's when i get time to, to write it and it's going to be something like why the esoteric matters or why the occult matters and it's going to be why it matters not preaching to the choir of people who are already convinced of this, but preaching to the people who, for whom this is just, like you said, crazy nonsense or whatever. Right. And it's going to be an argument that, that many of the ideas to be found in, in this um, field of study are important and they're important for all the kinds of lessons that we can glean from them. And so what I would want to do is put on a guru hat and say, here's my take on all the answers to all this stuff. I don't, I'm not, I don't think I have those answers and I don't know that I will. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do have from a scholarly point of view is I think there's a lot of things that we could learn from this. And I, I have one of the episodes that I have up on alchemy. And one of the episodes that I have on alchemy is misconceptions about alchemy. And one of the misconceptions is that it's pseudoscience and we should forget about it. It just should be tucked into the dustbin of history, or at least it should just be moldering on bookshelves and no one should really pay attention to it, much less chemist or whatever. I think that's a foolish way of thinking about things. It's short-sighted for lots of reasons, one of which is that for the alchemist, nature isn't a thing that you just go to and extract from willy-nilly. There's a balance that has to be struck because you're part of the system you're taking from. And so taking with, a, taking with abandon without any sense that you're part of the system that you're taking from is going to lead to an imbalance and you're going to, get, you're going to generate trouble. Mm -hmm. And I wish, right, I could go back in time, you know, and... and 
ring the bell to, you know, when we first discovered that you could just take dinosaur goop and pump it into things and make things go, that taking without responsibility is going to lead to disaster. And that's a kind of lesson that I think we can learn from the alchemists. Um, that's that can, or to, as I tell my students, I teach young scientists and I tell my students, can does not imply should just because you can unleash the power of the atom doesn't mean that you should. And the alchemists were very careful about that. They were like, there are things that we must be very, very careful about, because if we do this, if we let Pandora, if we open Pandora's box, we can't get those things back in there. Right. And I think that that kind of humility in that kind of, uh, in that kind of um, slowness on the part of the alchemists is a lesson I wish more scientists, uh, more scientists had. So yeah, I think the book I want to eventually write is a a book about why this stuff matters to the people to whom it doesn't matter. Right. Something right. like that. It's incredible. Um, what are your? I have, I have, I have uh, one important question. I guess on, on the philosophy side. Can't hear you, Eric. Can't hear you. Can hear you better now. Yeah, that's better. Um, more on the philosophy side. As far as is there a meaning? What's the meaning to life, or is it the meaning to a person's life? Is it individual, or is an is there an overall arc of this is the purpose of life? I like. There's this old existentialist idea, right? That the world is meaningless. Like this is sort of the ground level of existentialism. The world is meaningless, but that is also meaningless, right? There's something interesting about the the meaningless of the world is meaningless, and so. What I like about that idea is that we basically have a blank slate, that meaning is something that now becomes our responsibility, not, not a thing that is thrust upon us from outside. And so I think that meaning is all about, for me, meaning is about responsibility and responsibility is, and freedom, in fact. And freedom is choosing what we're going to be responsible for. We, in the, I think in America, we typically think of freedom as like the cowboy out on the range with the government doesn't bother you, you can do what you want or laying on the beach and no one can bother you. That's, a, I think, a not great idea of what freedom is. Freedom is choosing what you're going to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. That is a much more powerful idea of, of freedom. And I think that once we, once we discover, once we choose what we're going to be responsible for, then it allows us to flourish, right? And that word, right, in Greek, eudaimonia, it literally means to have a good soul. The same word daimon, right, is in that word. To flourish in ancient Greek means to have eudaimonia, to have a good soul. And so I don't like the idea of happiness because I'm not, you could be happy and be stupid, and I think that's not healthy. Um, um, just don't. Um, and, and, and I think also, I think you could be happy and be bad. I mean, I think that Joseph Stalin may have been happy to the day he died, and I don't want to be someone like him. Um, and so I think of flourishing. And I think flourishing has everything to do with choosing what we're going to be responsible for. And that's part of what I like in um, a lot of the literature that I, I study, this mysticism and stuff, is that um, there's a profound sense of responsibility in a lot of this literature, that you, you're you unlocking secrets to the fundamental nature of reality. And a lot of these mystics and a lot of these magicians, um, they have a you can tell they have a deep sense of responsibility because the one thing they tell you over and over again is, you have to be careful. You have to be responsible. You have to be quiet. You have to be silent. You should keep this stuff secret. Don't don't let it, don't teach it to people who aren't ready for it yet, but people who are ready for it yet, and you have to you know bring them into the fold. So I don't think meaning is something ready made. I think something meaning is something. It meaning is a verb. It's something we that we do, and we do it. I think in the best way that we the best ways that we do it. We do it by choosing to be responsible, and that is how we flourish as human beings. What are your top five favorite books on the subject? And esotericism. Yeah. Oh wow. Should have emailed me beforehand so I could think. I could, I could, med I could, med I could, I could meditate longer on this. It's got to uh, be like on on the fly. That's what we like about this. Yeah. So what are some of the ones I like? Meister Eckhart. Uh, Meister Eckhart, um, the Christian mystic of the the 14th century. Uh, his sermons are some of the most mind blowing uh, forms of mysticism that I know. He combines uh, intellectual rigor with with deep spiritual experiences in a way that I don't know that really that hardly I know anyone who parallels that um, so much so I do calligraphy uh, I'm a calligrapher and one of his uh, one of his uh, sermons I found so impactful that I copied the entire thing by hand wow. about, it's about 30 pages and I copied it just like you would have copied it in the in the 14th century it took me weeks 
because wow. uh, I wanted to meditate on each and every letter of it because I thought it was so profound. So Meister Eckhart's sermons um, are, are we one. Um, what else? I, I like um, the Ennead by Plotinus. Uh, Plotinus, the great uh, Neoplatonic philosopher, developed uh, basically mysticism in the Western world would not exist without Plotinus. Um, and he wrote this incredible book called The Ennead, which is a philosophical uh, exploration of the limits of, of, of everything. I mean, it's really just a mind blowing book mm -hmm. from the third century. So The Ennead by Plotinus. Um, what else? What else are some of these these? If classes? you want to go top three, that's fine too. Yeah, I'm trying to think of uh, other kinds of books like this that are that are really mind blowing. Um, the Zohar, obviously, the the Zohar, the the Jewish book of, of of mysticism. I will say it's it remains the single most intimidating book that I've I've ever approached. Um, really? Yeah, it remains really intimidating to me. It's written yeah, in a very yeah. it's written in a very obscure dialect of Aramaic. It's very difficult to understand. You can tell that. You, ever, you know the old saying, right? If you don't know who the sucker is at the table, it's you. Um, the Zohar always makes me feel like I don't know who the sucker is, so I definitely know it's me. Um, <laughs> it's talking, it's just talking circles around me, and it, it, it's right. um, it's just such a powerful text that I feel like, uh, even as a person who studied it for many, many years, I feel like I still, you know, it's like I still don't have a handle on it, really. Oh, so right. it's it's it remains um, it remains difficult, and also I like about it because it, it invites you in. It's just a bunch of guys sitting around having conversations. And, and so it's not written in some strange code or anything like that. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's a conversation that immediately you, you realize you've stepped off the deep end and, um, and you know, you're swimming if you're, if you're lucky. D was hard. You know, I'm in the middle of five books of mysteries and it's, it's not easy. You're kind of dis deciphering the words, you know, he spells desire, D-E-S-Y-R-E. -E. Right. Yeah, so, like, the old, yeah, the old English or the middle, the, the early modern English where they haven't, you know, standardized spelling and stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's reading the manuscripts. I've worked with, I've actually worked with the, the original manuscripts of, of the D's sessions, uh, handled those manuscripts and um, God to the end of when you get to the later revelations, um, the ones that are um, the daughter of fortitude and the ones that they're having primarily in Europe. D's handwriting is so hurried and so bad that it's so it's very very difficult to to uh, to even to even decipher. It. Really? But, yeah, I've handled some of those manuscripts, which is. Um, Do you have them? Do you have them in your possession? The actually, though the original manuscripts are in the British Library, um, okay. but uh, yeah, those manuscripts are in the British Library. But I have the uh, I've consulted them there, and I have the complete works down here. The the standard version now, the complete works that have everything neatly typeset and things like that. Really. I also say that the works of D remain a, a, a an, an enigma to me, um, and when you really study them at length, uh, it's really perplexing what's going on there. Right. That, that whatever's going on with D and Kelly is so the psychodynamics of that situation. You know, they swapped wives at one point because they yeah. to, and um, and they even tried to obliterate it in the manuscripts. They tried to erase the fact that they had done it. Um, but if you look at it under on uh, in ultraviolet light, you can see the words pactum factum, uh, the deal done. They did it. Um, and that basically ended it. That basically was enough. Um, right. And you, and you know, the the moments where where Kelly tells D to basically go before Rudolph II and condemn him to his face. Can you imagine walking into the court of the Holy Roman Emperor and condemning him because a bunch of angels told you to to do that? These people just they they hanged people for fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, just that was like a Tuesday for them. <laughs> so I, I can't imagine. Um, the, the, there, was something, there was a dynamic between Kelly and D. I, I, I don't know what it was, but reading their stuff, just you know, I don't. I think John D was real. Edward Kelly, I don't really know. Kelly, a strange guy. And all, you know, also people also forget that you know uh, John D uh, had a totally different scrying partner when he returned to England, Bartholomew yeah. Hickman, and they had almost I think fifteen years of scrying sessions that just aren't recorded. We just don't have. They, they just don't. They just didn't get recorded. And I think we only have about seven of D and Kelly. Uh, if they got recorded, they were destroyed. And of course, the manuscripts of D and Kelly were, were hidden. They, right. um, which is also interesting to me because it's clear that D never tried to make any money on any of this. He wasn't trying to con anyone. These are profound journeys into something. Um, right. The mind, the unconscious, the spiritual world, I don't know. Right. Uh, but they remain, they remain to me a sort of steadfast thing. In fact, 
people have asked me, why haven't you done an Esoterica episode on Dee and Kelly? It's because I still, even though I've written, I've published about them, I've read them over the years since I was 12, right. I still right. find it difficult to, to, to settle exactly where I want to land on it. And so with my unsettledness, I, I don't want to touch them because I'm, uh, I find them perplexing, deeply perplexing. The, right. the mysticism novice, where would you tell him or her to start? The mysticism novice? Yeah. I guess it depends on what they would want out of the deal. Um, what they would want out of the deal. Um, they want a million dollars because they want to start praying to the archangels. Like, okay. Uh, if, 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 if someone wants to, uh, yeah, if someone wants to practice uh, something like angel magic, um, yeah, I would, I would have them, if they want to study something like angel magic, I would uh, take a look at um, the, some of the texts from um, Dee and Kelly. Um, that take a look at those texts. Um, if they want an academic source on that, uh, uh, there's two great books, one by Deborah Harkness uh, called The Conversations with Angels uh, and another by uh, Eagle Asprim, who's a former colleague of mine. He wrote a book um, uh, called Argu Arguing with the Angels, which is a modern take on them. And then you're reading Dee and Kelly's actual, um, Dee and Kelly's actual works. Um, Dee was in Shakespeare. Shakespeare, he was Prospero, I think. Prospero, in yeah, many, people, many people think that Prospero was based on, on Dee, which seems very reasonable to me. We don't, have, we don't have Bill telling us that he did that, but Right. Uh, it seems very likely that that Shakespeare, and of course, also you know, D was uh, his spy number for uh, Queen Elizabeth was zero zero seven. Yeah, yep. so, uh, Ian Fleming was was a uh, you know, but that's the point. This is kind of like kind of wraps up the, the show that like what we said in the beginning. Jimmy Page, the greatest band of all time, Led Zeppelin, was into the occult. Tool, the greatest drummer of all time, Danny Carey, is into the occult. You know, Shakespeare clearly was was something there. Yeah, right. you know, actually, you know, the house that uh, that Jimmy Page owned, Boleskine, where Crowley did the Abramelin. I'm yeah. actually in, in talks uh, with uh, the guy who owns it now, who's uh, it burned down sadly. It was the yeah. victim of arson. I actually have a uh, a piece of wood from the oratory uh, where Crowley did the, uh, the Abramelin ritual. Um, so I have an actual piece of the house, um, which I don't know if it's imbued with magical powers or not, but uh, can't hurt to have the magic on your side. Um, but uh, I'll be doing an episode on the Abramelin ritual, which is the, the ritual that uh, Crowley did, or partially did. He it didn't complete it. Uh, right. And I'll be talking to uh, um, the guy who owns the, who, well, his foundation owns the home, and they're in the process of rebuilding it. And their long-term goal to rebuilding it is to basically make it a kind of uh, node for the study of Western esotericism. So... Oh. Boleskin, the actual Boleskin house uh, is going to be a, uh, I think one of these sort of central places for the study of Western esotericism as an institution at some point uh, in the future, which I'm looking forward to greatly. It's amazing. amazing. Dr. Justin, thank you so much for coming on our show. Really, yeah. really, really appreciated. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Thank for, thank you for having me on. Uh, where can people find you, Justin? Please plug away where you're at. Yeah, you can find me. Uh, my website is just justinsledge.com. Uh, folks can contact me there. And also, folks can find me on uh, on YouTube. Um, my channel is called Esoterica. Uh, if you just go into uh, YouTube and search for Esoterica, uh, I think the actual URL is Esoterica Channel. Uh, folks can find me there. If you just Google Esoterica YouTube, I should come up pretty high on the, the list. And uh, yeah, I try to respond to as many comments on uh, on the channel as I can. Um, and we put out content basically every Friday. I have an episode coming out tomorrow on uh, one of the Gnostic texts. So probably, uh, what I what I argue is actually the uh, best first Gnostic text to read, which is a text called the Apocryphon of John. And I do a long introduction. It's about, the episode's about 40 minutes long. Um, and so, um, so you can find me basically every Friday. I put out an episode and um, yeah, you can find me there. I'd love to interact with folks. You have a platform on Open Bros anytime you want to come on. And when you write that book, I have a, a hotshot literary agent that represents me. I'm a writer as well. So oh. when you need ready to do that work for the masses, the book, you uh you know you let me know but anytime you want to come on here i literally have a million more questions to ask you but i know we're out of time um dr justin Slips, thank you a million times over hang on one second we're going to sign off thank you guys thanks for coming on like subscribe and share leave comments down below if you guys have any questions thanks everybody so go to esoteric on youtube and go listen to dr sledge he knows exactly what he's talking about thank you guys bye-bye